Okay, dear friends, we're about to begin. I hope everyone can hear me. Someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, thank you. Um, we have just entered or just about to enter into a third wave, unfortunately, of COVID here in Ontario. And um, it was especially therefore important for us to be able to gather together to do a Yisker service as a community virtually. Um, and as wonderful as it is to see you all on the screen, I really do look forward to the time that, God willing, we're all together very, very soon. And uh, whether it's going to be next Shavuot, this coming Shavuot, which will be in seven weeks or a little bit less than seven weeks for our next Yizkor, or whether it'll be for Yom Kippur, I'm confident that very, very soon we'll be all back together. I wanted to share with you just a few opening comments before we pass it over to um, our Chazan, David Klein, to lead us in a Yizkor service. We enter into these last days of Pesach, perhaps a bit fuller in our stomachs and a bit more rested, just like any other year. But there's something different about this Pesach from last year's. Last year, we had only just begun to descend into a pandemic. And this year, we are slowly, at least it appears to be, that we are emerging out of it. Just as spring brings new life and growth, so do we leave Pesach this year with that anxious anticipation of new horizons and a new life ahead. The last days of Pesach commemorate what happened shortly after we left Egypt. We encountered a new threat. Paro decided that he wasn't done with us, and so he amassed his army and pursued us into the desert. Many commentaries note the seemingly gratuitous nature of this postscript to the Exodus story. We had already won. Hashem brought Egypt to its knees with the 10 plagues. Why was this post-Exodus miraculous event at all necessary? Why harden Paro's heart yet again, only to bring him to another defeat? One way of viewing the uniqueness of the events at the Red Sea is to note that while B'nai Israel were in Egypt, they lived miserable lives as slaves to be sure, but they never had to encounter their own mortality. That is, Egypt was not seeking the Jews' destruction, merely their domination. The Jews knew that as long as they behaved submissively as slaves, they'd be able to live out their full lives, continue having children, and life would go on. But now when they arrived at the Red Sea, they realized that they had nowhere to escape. The Egyptians were pursuing them from behind, and they were in real mortal danger. Paro's objective at this point was not to bring the Jews back to Egypt, but it was rather to annihilate them. As the Jews later recited in Az Yashir, which we're going to read on the seventh day of Pesach, Omar Oyev, the enemy said, Tim lo emo nafshi arik charbi torishemu yadi, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. It seems that this was the main objective for the Red Sea event and what made it unique and necessary to bring the Jewish people to a place where they would have to face death. They needed to come to a point where they might lose their lives before they were able to be counted as Hashem's chosen people. And why is that? Because only when one faces their own death do they realize the full meaning of their life. Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century religious philosopher, talked about this kind of anxiety that we face when we contemplate our own mortality. Thinking about death can cause depression and hopelessness which is why man tends to block it out of his mind. But there are moments in life when we are forced to face mortality, whether it's narrowly escaping injury or illness. Sometimes the aftermath of that experience is extremely cathartic and provides us with a new attitude towards life. As one work paraphrases Kierkegaard's ideas, it's only when we dare to experience the full anxiety of knowing that life does not go on forever that we can experience transcendence and get in touch with the infinite. To use an analogy from Gestalt psychology, non-being is the necessary ground for the figure of being 
to make itself known to us. It's only when we're willing to let go of all of our illusions and admit that we are lost and helpless and terrified that we will be free of ourselves and our false securities and ready for what Kierkegaard calls the leap of faith. We can actually trace this leap of faith that became embedded within B'nai Israel from the scripture that we're going to read. They complained to Moshe, Hamibali ein kivarim b'mitzrayim? Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Chadal mimenu v'navdat mitzrayim, leave us alone. Let us just serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. The experience was completely new and undesirable to them. For the first time, they had to confront the prospect of death for the sake of an ideal, for the sake of something larger than their own survival. Moshe responded to them that all would be good. His final words were, Hashem yilachem lachem v'atem tacharishun. Hashem will fight for you, and you will be macharish, is the word in Hebrew. We usually translate that word as you will be silent, but that translation is lacking because being silent is really not doing anything at all, but rather the absence of speaking, it's passive. But the verb structure of macharish is hif'il, which is to be active. How can one be actively silent? We note that the shoresh of this word macharish is charash, which is the same root for the act of plowing and constructive manufacture. Even in modern Hebrew, what do you call a factory where they manufacture things? A beit charoshet. Sometimes silence is a productive act because it allows a person to cultivate their thoughts before saying what's on their mind. Moshe was essentially telling the people, this encounter that you're having now with your own mortality is necessary for you to cultivate within yourselves that sense of transcendence, a purpose for being, and an appreciation for life. Without confronting the prospect of dying, you will not properly appreciate your purpose in life. Or as Martin Luther King Jr. put it, if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. One of the silver linings of this past year is that all of us had a closer encounter with the fragility of life. All of us know someone who either passed away or suffered a loss in their own family. We either personally experienced or know someone who experienced this illness, as well as people who were placed on respirators or were hospitalized. We continue to daven for members of our community who are still in the hospital hovering between life and death. And we will never give up on our prayers and our compassionate beseeching to Hashem that he should grant them a refuah shalema. Some of you may recall that for one of our Sunday morning Zoom shows several weeks ago, I interviewed Eli Beer, the director of United Hatzalah in Israel. Eli was one of the first high-profile COVID patients in the Jewish community and was placed on a ventilator for several weeks in a Miami hospital. Eli was at death's door for weeks, teetering on the precipice. I asked him, how the experience changed him. He told me, I realized how fragile life is. You can be the strongest person in the world and in one instant, everything changes. I realized that I have to use my time more smartly. Hashem gives us breathing lungs and a beating heart and we have to use them properly. Even though I had been previously working around the clock, I still didn't value the time I have in this life as much as I should have. I now spend more time with my family. And when I'm with my family, I actually spend it only with them. When I meet with someone, I meet only with them and make sure that I'm not doing four other things at the same time. I realize that after almost being dead, I had not put my time to good use. And so I decided that I must live in the moment and give my full attention to the situation at hand. The same is true when I'm with my children or my elderly mother. When I'm with them, I put my phone away because I now realize that at any moment it could all be over. So let's use our time, Ellie concluded, in the best way possible. In order for B'nai Yisrael to realize their role as Hashem's nation, who would receive the Torah and live life larger than it had ever been lived before, they needed to confront their own mortality. And now, dear friends, 
as we embark on these last days, as we embark on these last days that bring us to spring and bring us to new life, we will recite Yisker and once again remember the fragility of life. As we recall all those who left this world, some at a ripe old age, Bikitsam, and others while in the prime of their lives, Shalom Bikitsam. Let us take their lives and life itself to heart. We recognize that our own lives are limited and that we have a finite time here in this life. As we come out of this year and its pandemic, let us recommit to the truly transcendent nature of life, to living life in the moment, to take our Yiddishkeit seriously, and to recommit ourselves to our loved ones and to our beloved Ribona Shalom. Let us pray that we will not need another encounter with death for a very, very long time, and that we have already been duly vaccinated against taking life for granted. In this spirit, I'm asking you, I'm asking you all, whether you're listening to this live or watching it at some time later, to take on something new, take on a new mitzvah, a new practice, a new Kabbalah, in memory of a loved one or in the zechus of a refua shalema for someone who is ill. Make your new life count more than your old life. We have been plowing, we've been macharish over this past year. We've had a chance to ruminate over the future and what we need to do differently in order for life to regain its meaning. As a response to their argument, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moshe's response was, you're mistaken. It's better to die with purpose than to live without it. Just as we pray that our loved ones should have an aliyah's neshama, so let us pray that our future selves will also have an aliyah in living our lives with greatness. And now, dear friends, before we begin um, our Yisker service, I would just like to acknowledge all of the, uh, all of the kind people who were responsible for making Yisker happen tonight, who graciously sponsored this Yisker service. To Marjorie and Gershon Green and family in loving memory of Marjorie's father, Dr. Benjamin Masuda Binyamin Ben Yaakov Zal. To Rachel Schwartz in memory of her husband, Menachem Mendel Ben Moshe the Pearl, and her parents, Shlomo Ben Mordechai Verifka and her mother, Yona Bat Yechiel Vigitl. To the Aaron, Kraft, and Führer families, on the yard site of their wife and mother, Renee Aaron, Rachel Bas Beryl, on the 20th of Nisan, and to Andy and Elki Gelberger, on the yard site of Elki's mother, Miriam Beck, Mindel Bas Menachem Mendel Zal. We thank you all, and may the neshamas of all your loved ones, as, all of, as well as all of the loved ones who are saying Yisker tonight and over Yantif, may they all have an alias neshama. It is now at this time that I will be passing over the microphone to, uh, to, um, to David Klein, and I'm going to be bringing the, uh, the Yisker service on, on, on a shared screen. Please note that we will start Yisker with the very end of the Yisker service with the Kiel Males for those who fell in the Shoah and those who fell defending and upholding the state of Israel. David. El Malay Rachamim Shoichein Bamiroi Mim Amse Minuchanichoi Na Al Kanfei Hashechina Bimahalo Kedoshim Utahirim Kizoyhar Arakia Mahasirim Es Nishmois Hakidoshim Hatoirim Shahumasu Vishnehergu Vishnehishetu Vishnehishrefu Vishnehitbu Vishnehneku Al Kiddush Hashem 
על ידי הצעירים הגרמנים, יימח שמם וזכרו. בעבור שאר המספרים לאילו נשמעיסיהם, בגן עדן, בגן עדן תהה מנוכסם. ולכן בעל הרחמים, יסתירי בסייסר כנפיו לעולמים. ליצור בצרור החיים ושתשמעיסיהם. אדוני הוא נחלסם. ויאנוכו בשלום. ויאנוכו ושלום על משכבו יסיים ואינו ימר אמן. אל מלא רחמים שייכן במירה המציאים נוכן נכוי נא על כנפי השכינה במהלויס קדושים תהיירים וגיבורים ZANG <laughs> ושנפלו במלחמתם, ומסרו נפשם על קידוש אס השם, העם והארץ. בעבור שאנו מספרנים, ואילו נשמעיסיהם, ובגן עידן, בגן עידן. ולכן בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסייסר כנפיו לעולמים ויצרור בצרור החיים אס תשמעיסיהם אדוני הוא נחלסם ויענוכו ושלום על משכבו יסיים ושמוי לכל ישראל זכו סהם ויעמדו לגוי עולם לקץ הימין ונוי מר אמן. אדוני מר אדם ותדע אהו בן אנוש ותח שביהו. אדם להבר דמה, ימיו כצל אויבר. בבוי כיציץ וחלף, לא ערב ימי ליל ויבש. נמנעיס ימינו כן הידה. ונביא לבב חכמה. שמור תם וראי אשר, כי אחריס לי שלום. אך אלוהים יפתה נפשי מיד שאוהל, כי ייקחה ניסלע. כל השארי ולבבי, צור לבבי בחלקי, אלוהים לי אוהלם. 
We're now going to say the Kel Mole for previous members of the Bayit who have left this world and for whose memory we, we pray at this time. Kel Mole Rachamim Shoichein Bamerahoyimim Amitzei Minucha Nechoyna Confessed, Masirim as Bavur Shanachim is Paladim, the Adhas Koras Dishmoy Sehem. Began Eden, began Eden to Hem in Ukasam. Oilachain Balarakamim, Yastirain. 
Friends, this concludes our Yisker service for tonight. I'd like to thank Chazan David Klein for leading us. I'd like to thank you all for being on the call. And one more thing that we'll do before we end this evening, for those who davened early or have not yet counted Sphira, last night we counted four. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kedeshanu b'mitzvosav v'bitzivanu al Sephira sa'omer hayom chamisha yamim ba'omer. Rahman Yachas or Lano Dora Space Lam Mikdash and Kom of Bimhair of Yomenu Amen Sela. Let me take this opportunity once again to wish you a Chag Sameach, a good Shabbos, and may all of the loved ones that we've commemorated this evening have an Aliyah's Neshama. And I look forward to seeing you very, very soon for happy, joyful things. Chag Sameach, everyone. Shabbat Shalom.